for us to be more aware, more alert, and more uh, forewarned so that you are forearmed. And joining me to have that conversation, I'm joined by Timothy Kelly, who is Head of Business Development at AA Kenya. Welcome, sir. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, meet in due season when it comes to safety at this point in time. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a lot of traveling. There's going to be uh, different modes of travel, road, air, rail, mm -hmm. as people get into the festive season. Let's just start off with your general introduction of what we need to be cautious about. I think when we talk about road safety, we talk about taking care of yourself and the other road users. This could involve the other motorists, mm. cyclists, and pedestrians. Mm. And it's about being cautious that it's not just about you. Your behavior could cause harm to other people who are also using the road. And they not necessarily be people who are driving, they could also be pedestrians, or, be pedestrians or cyclists. Or cyclists. Mm. Um, when you talk about road safety, we look at the things that lead to road carnage. And among them, uh, I think top among them is intoxication. Okay. Especially around this time of festivities, mm. there is that tendency for people to want to enjoy. To enjoy and overindulge. And overindulge. Mm. And uh, intoxication affects two things when you're on that road. It impairs your judgment. Mm. You're not able to really tell how far a vehicle is and any other judgment that you need to apply on that road. And it also affects the response time in case of an emergency or in case of something comes up, you're not able to have the uh, your reflexes. Your reflexes are not really on point. Mm. So you're not able to react quickly to be able to avoid an accident. And that could mean that you needed to either brake or swerve the car to the side or do something, take an action that would be um, would, would help to avoid yeah. that kind of crash. Mm. Mm. So intoxication is, is by far, I think, around this festive season, the, the, the biggest culprit in terms of road safety. The second thing is fatigue. Um, there's a chance that, Michael, a lot of people will be taking long journeys right. back to the village, mm. as tradition, as we've, we've always done. And some of these journeys are not journeys that we are used to. Uh, some of us left the village when we were not driving. So we came and we learned how to drive, and we never really took that long journey. Mm. So this is going to be the first time. Now here you are with a car driving all that way. You're here, and everybody in the family has voted for you. To mm, drive. To drive, to be the designated to, to driver. To be the designated driver. <laughs> Correct. And it's a long journey, and, and, and fatigue kicks in. The excitement of going home sometimes makes you not sleep well. And I think one of the things I keep saying is that you cannot compete with your body. Mm. When your body is tired and when your body is fatigued, it begins to shut down and critical functions to maintain whatever is necessary for your survival. Mm. And that's why some of the things that shut down is your eyes. Mm. So if you don't take enough rest before you take that journey... And the body already begins to dictate that it's time for us to The rest. body tells you what to do, mm. and, and it begins to do that. Mm. And, and why that is critical is because when you're moving on the road, and I know we have speed limits, and I'll be talking about that as one of the factors. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, when you are going at 100 kilometers per hour, that's about 27 meters per second. Right. If you doze for four seconds, how far will you have gone before? That's times four. Wow, that's, yes. that's a long distance. That's 100 meters. Mm. That's actually more than 100 in meters. In four seconds. In four seconds, if you just doze for two or three seconds, that's enough for you to move 100 meters. And how much damage can you cause within mm. that period? Mm. So, so, so it's important for the designated driver to take enough rest. Okay, Let, let's go back to the uh, intoxication because that, 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 that's where we started off from. And the question of how much is too much. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who say, I know my body. For me, I'm able to drive even when I'm drunk, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. uh, how does one gauge that? And maybe just to underscore the importance of the fact that once you're uh, body functions are compromised, really, as much as you may think you're the best driver, mm -hmm. you, you just aren't. Michael, we always think we know until it happens. Right. I would advocate for zero. Zero. Intoxication. If you're driving on that road, don't, don't touch that bottle. Because you always think you know your body uh, until you're intoxicated and you're seeing two roads. Mm. And you're, able, you're not able to make a decision. If you're th already thinking that way before you take alcohol, I'm already worried about your judgment if mm. you take... <laughs> Once you've taken the alcohol. Anything. Mm. So, so for, for that person that is going to be on that road, I think it is important for them to be as alert as possible, to be in their best uh, state of mind as possible. And anything that comes to affect their state of mind, 
I think should be discouraged at all costs. Mm, mm. Yeah. All right, and maybe just to speak to passengers, because mm. we've had many cases where either, mm. uh, particularly on public transport, mm -hmm. you'll hear people after the accident saying, in fact, the driver was drunk. In fact, he was dozing. Mm -hmm. Maybe just some action that needs to be taken, because really, this is a matter of life and death. Mm. The last time I was in a matatu that was speeding, I actually made a lot of noise, and I told the driver, I want to alight. Mm. And I think I was traveling, um, well, let, let me not mention the route. Okay. But, 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 but it was, was it long distance or short distance? It was long distance. Okay. Um, I think if anything above 100 kilometers is long distance. So I, I made a lot of noise because I felt that uh, I'm being irresponsible just sitting here only to wait to give that story After. To, to the news. If at all you live to tell the story. If you live to tell the story, yeah. because you might not live to tell the story. Absolutely. So, so as, as passengers, you have the right to be driven in the right way. And the driver is, she should be subservient to your needs because you are paying them to do that. Absolutely. They're not it's a service you're paying for. It's a service you're paying for. Mm. And therefore, you should be able to, <clears throat> to, 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 to agree. And, and I see people, when, when I was making this noise, everybody was quiet. Mm. But when the matatu stopped, because I wanted to alight, mm. and they, of course, did not allow me to alight, but they now slowed down and we went, okay. And everybody started saying, now this is okay, this is fine. But I was like, you guys were keeping quiet all the time. All, all along you've been quiet and didn't say anything. Be quiet. People mm. don't want to be seen mm. to be bad. They don't want to be seen to be causing confrontational. problems. Or confrontational. Right. But I think you have a right to be able to highlight to the driver or whoever it is that I think you're taking us too fast. And it's not only on public transport. I think the worst would be when you're driving with your cousins especially, mm. with your family members, and they're telling you, yes, we have to overtake that one. Mm. We have to overtake they're the other one. They're actually encouraging you to They actually encourage you to do that. But, but there are those that will tell you, if you are with your parents or your aunties, they are likely to tell you, please slow no, down. Slow down, yeah. <clears throat> not in a rush. Michael, mm. Christmas is not an emergency. Right. Christmas has been here with us years on end. And we'd like to see many more. And guess what? <laughs> it's always on the same date. Mm. It's always on the same date, it's on 25th, which means we can plan. We can plan in advance, which is the other thing that I want to talk about, planning, planning. for your journey. Right. You know that you're going to do 100 kilometers. You know there are other road users on that road. It's likely to take you this much time. Please plan in advance. And then secondly, I don't think you can get late when you're going home especially in the village. Mm. You're not late. Mm. It's not like you're going to work and you have to be there by eight. Right. You're going home, and whatever it is that you're going to do, you're going to enjoy. You're, you're going literally to, going to relax. You're so going to, to relax. Really, you're not really going to work or anything like so, that. So, so, so it's not an emergency. Mm. So, so I think we can plan for that journey mm. and allocate enough time to be able to go. Mm -hmm. The other thing I've seen happening around road safety is people begin to race with other people mm -hmm. who they don't know and who they don't even know where they're going. Mm -hmm. So we just meet on the road, and for some reason, I want to overtake you, and then you also decide you want to overtake me. Almost uh, like a competition. Uh, it becomes a competition on the road, and we don't even know each other. You don't know where I'm going. I don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's very disappointing when the person you are racing against takes a turn off and right. <laughs> is going to <laughs> the home. That race is over, yes. That, that race is over. Mm. And sometimes it's not necessary yet it can cause uh, great fatalities in the event of an emergency mm. happening on that road. So planning also is critical. Uh, in mm. terms of planning, maybe just before we move away from that, mm. there is the aspect of uh, time. Mm. There's also the aspect of your body. Yes. Because, as, uh, you know, you'll find that sometimes people will leave uh, and you're going up country. Maybe mm -hmm. you leave at five, six in the evening when mm -hmm. you've been working the whole day. Mm -hmm. Maybe speak to, uh, and this, of course, uh, weighs into fatigue. Yeah. Even your body condition needs to have a plan such that you yes. wake up fresh mm -hmm. or you begin your journey at a time where you're able to take up the whole journey. Yes. Plan wisely. Take enough sleep before you travel. And if it's a long journey, please take breaks. And we recommend breaks of at least 20 minutes. Plan in advance to say, if I'm going to Mombasa, I'm going to take a break at Sultan Hamoud. I'm going to take another break at Mutituande. I'm going to take another break at Voi. Take about 20 minutes break. That sort of refreshes your mind. But you need to have taken enough sleep uh, before you start the journey. Mm. <clears throat> you remember in class, we used to do when you don't get enough sleep. Right. If you never won that battle in class, you're not going to win. What makes you think you're going to win it now? And right. especially on the road where it really matters. Mm. So you cannot compete against your own body. 
your own body says it's time to rest, please, you need to rest. Mm. There are times when I'm taking a journey, I would just park by the side of the road and take a nap for 30 minutes. Mm. A power nap, they call a it. A power nap. Mm. By the time you wake up, you feel fresh and you can be able to do... And you know, we keep lying to ourselves when you start feeling sleepy on the road. You put loud music, you open all the windows so that the you chew wind, gum. you chew gum, you do all those things. But for as long as your body is tired and fatigued, sleep will always win. Mm. And you'll always, and sometimes you don't live to tell the story. The people who end up in a ditch, others will realize when they are veering off the shoulder of the road. Right. <clears throat> but most people don't tell, don't live to tell that story. Mm. So it's a critical thing. Now, also maybe speaking to the passengers, because there are times you'll notice the driver is sleepy mm -hmm. or tired or fatigued. Maybe just to mention to others, not just in public vehicles, but even in private vehicles, yeah. uh, that either another driver takes over or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just pull over and relax, you know, take, mm -hmm. take a walk or something. Mm -hmm. For the drivers, what I can say is that don't be a hero. Take that break. For the passengers, demand, demand. that break. Demand. It's your life. Uh, th there's no joy in you surviving to say, I saw the driver over speeding or I saw the driver dozing, I saw the driver doing this and that. Demand. And I can tell you if, if the passengers in the vehicle all... Uh, shout at one voice and say, we demand that this vehicle be driven in a certain way, mm -hmm. the driver will bow down to their demands and there will be road safety. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you, when you want to travel after work, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure where Christmas falls on, uh, on Wednesday, we, we, the day before is a working day, right. and so people want to go to the office and then leave at some point and begin mm -hmm. to travel. Uh, if you're going for a long journey, I would, I'd advise against that. Just take some nice rest, wake up on Christmas Day on, in the morning, just drive slowly. Drive slowly. Get to your home. I was reading some statistics somewhere, and maybe you could tell us if that's true, mm -hmm. that actually fatigue sometimes is worse than a drunken driver. Yes. That's yes. true. Fatigue kills more than drunken drivers. Mm. And I'm not encouraging people who are, who are not drinking. Not at all. Not at all. Absolutely. <laughs> fatigue is because fatigue, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Mm. The only way to solve a problem fatigue of fatigue is to rest. Is to rest. Mm. So um, most drivers would drive, especially those who do long journeys at night, you'll find that they were engaged during the day, mm. during some activity, and then they decide, uh, I'm going to drive during the night. Mm. There's that so one point, and sometimes they make it in most of the journeys because there are not many road users, but once in a while, the sleep takes over. The sleep takes over. And, okay. and, and, and it's, it's, it's a disaster. All right. There was also the question of speed limits. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. as a country, what we tend to do mm -hmm. is we wait for where the road traps are and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, slow down at that point. But maybe it's good to, and mm -hmm. it's important to know that those speed limits are for mm -hmm. our safety. They're not mm -hmm. for police to harass. Yes. About speed limit, th th there are things that we do on the road. And, and, and our culture, like you said, is that... Uh, even when you talk about the speed limit, we, we do it for the police. For the police. And, and we know there's likely to be a camera here. Mm. Uh, in some countries, what they've done is that they normally put a warning sign mm. in, in places where you are likely to overspeed. Mm. And they will put a warning sign to say that there's a speed camera. Right. The, because the idea is not to catch you. It's to, the idea is to it's make to you, is to enforce right. that, you don't, that you don't go fast. Mm. Uh, those speed limits that have been prescribed... 50 kilometers per hour in a residential area, even if there is no speed limit sign, where there are residential areas or where there is a town or whatever, you should be careful to note that anybody can cross the road at any one given time. And I, like I said, 50 kilometers per hour is about 13 meters per second. Now, I don't know, what, what would be your response time to react to an emergency? I'd say about, uh, and that's with a good reflex, maybe mm. about, what, five seconds? Five seconds. Mm. So if you are at 50 kilometers per hour, and that means about 13 meters per second, 13.8 mm -hmm. meters, call it 14, 14. Uh, times five, you'll have moved 70 meters. Before you respond. Before you respond. Mm. So you can imagine the impact of that if you're not alert. And if you had over, uh, you had overspread in an area of 50, and you're going at 80, which means you'd be at around 22, meters per second. Mm. And it takes one second to notice there's a problem, another second to think about it, a third second to react, a fourth second to possibly take corrective action, and a fifth second for that action to 
materialize. Mm. So if you go in at 100 kilometers per hour, it's about 27 meters per second, that means you'll have done 100 meters before you're able to correct that, that problem. Wow. So when you're observing those speed limits, it's not because you don't want to be caught by the police. It's because the way you react when an emergency occurs, and there are other places where, especially towards the upcountry, where there'll be animals crossing, there might be children crossing, there might be other obstacles that might appear on the road. You need to be alert that uh, with this vehicle that I have, I need to be able to stop it, or I need to be able to take corrective measures within a certain period. And how much distance do I need? I'm sure when you went to driving school, you were told that uh, you need to keep 70 meters between you and the car ahead Correct. of you. Mm -hmm. It is about the same thing, the mm -hmm. response time. Because mm -hmm. if you're going, and mostly that will be in town, or, or, or just within uh, the outskirts of town, 50 kilometers per hour, it means if you take five, four, five seconds, that means it's that 14 meters times five mm -hmm. is 70 meters. That's 70. That's the time you need to avoid an accident between you and the car ahead of you. Mm. So the wow. speed limits are about your safety. Mm. It's not about being caught by the police. In mm. fact, we give the police too much work. That they have to, you know, be somewhere where they cannot be seen and, you know, get the speed gun. Mm. And then when you get there, you're also arguing because, you know, you're saying, this is my car, I've been yes. driving for the last 20 years. Mm. It's not about driving for the last 20 years. It's about that day when you are over speeding and you're unable to operate that vehicle, you're unable to bring it to a stop. That's the day that it really matters. Now, speed limits, of course, have been, uh, they're, they're, they're supposed to be signs uh, that show you speed limits for certain areas, and there are reasons why mm. certain areas you're allowed to go at 100, others 80, others mm. 50, and even 30. Mm -hmm. What's the recommended speed, given that sometimes you may have passed that sign, and maybe just a general mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, overview of speeds and where we should be cautious? Because there are times you may not find that sign, mm -hmm. but it's a densely populated area. I mean, mm -hmm. you'd not expect that you'd be doing 100 kilometers at mm -hmm. that point, but you find people still speeding on. Mm -hmm. I think part of the highway code is taught in driving school. And I think if we remember, and that's why sometimes people might need to do some refresher courses because we, we are taught that, like where there are shops or where there are residential houses, mm -hmm. regardless of whether there's a speed limit sign, it should be 50 kilometers per hour. If you get on a dual carriageway, I think it would be 100 kilometers per hour, up to, in some dual carriageways, they recommend 110 19. kilometers mm -hmm. per hour. The other places where you see 80 kilometers per hour, the other places you see, if a road is being constructed and there's a detour, uh, it's 40 kilometers per hour. And all those signs and all those speed limits are taught when you're learning how to drive. It should be part of you. The signs is just a reminder. Mm. So, so people argue, oh, I was speeding because I did not see the sign. No, no, no. You, you're supposed to know. Mm. And, and again, you also look at the conditions of the road because all these things and the discussions we've had so far presupposes a dry road, a, a road that has no issues. And it does not take care of a slippery road during the rainy season, doesn't take care of driving at night, doesn't take care of other conditions that might affect your ability to make judgment on the road. So this, all this presupposes that the road is dry and the road is... Uh, the visibility is the vis also Visibility clear. is clear and is okay and everything is fine. You, you, you'll find that, especially as you approach uh, the rural areas, the, the way the roads have, have been made and they have to meander around some hills, the visibility on oncoming vehicles may not be very clear, and sometimes that might also affect the way you manage your vehicle. So, so for, for me, those speed limits, they're things that we need to be... And if you go back to that driving school manual that you have, you, you find all of them there. Mm. And the signs that are put, and I, I think the bodies that are charged with that have done quite some good work mm. in terms of putting those signs, but those signs are meant to remind you. They're purely reminders, so you should already have an internal an reminder, in so to speak. Yes. And uh, you've brought in an interesting aspect. Two mm. things. One, how do we adjust based on weather? Because, mm. uh, like you're saying, uh, mm. that presupposes a dry road. Yes. But we know that especially December has been rainy and mm. wet as, uh, more than usual. But uh, generally, when the weather conditions change, mm. how do we adjust? First and foremost, I want to say, if you find a flooded river, do not cross. Do not cross it. Um, if you, you are, when your car doors are closed, and you get into that water and it's above the body, where the body of a car starts, your car literally becomes a boat. Mm. And I know you, f you think your car is quite heavy, but I can tell you a ship is heavier. Right. 
So, so the moment you get into that car, as long as there is air inside according to the laws of physics, then your car becomes a boat. And that's why it's so easy to move even a lorry or a matatu or as long as... The water can sweep it away inside. As long as the water, there is water outside and there is air inside, it becomes a boat. So don't cross a flooded river. Wait for the waters to subside. The second thing is that when you realize that the road conditions are not the usual, it's not a dry road, then you need to take more precaution. If you were to possibly go at 100 kilometers per hour, you may need to reduce that to about 70, you need to reduce that to about 60, because you do not have full control of that vehicle. When you steer, when you apply the brakes, you're likely to skid, you need to be able to manage that vehicle. So you need to reduce that speed. You cannot drive the same way, the same that, way that, that, you that, that you drive if, uh, if, if the roads were dry, mm. even on tarmac. Mm. And I'm not just talking about the off-road. Right. Uh, even on tarmac, it mm. gets slippery at some point. Mm. But floods, it's a no-no. It's a no-no. There's also the, the question of fog and mist, mm -hmm. which can uh, completely or partially make the, the, the visibility mm. uh, a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. That calls for you to be extremely cautious and to be very observant and to, if possible, reduce that speed if you, because if visibility is near zero, it means you can drive into anything. Mm. You can drive into an animal, oncoming. you can drive into an oncoming traffic and do not overtake. In those conditions, please do not overtake. Because mm. the other person cannot see. Mm. And, 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 and it's always recommended where it's, there is fog and mist, even if it's during the day, put on your headlights. Mm. So that at least you increase the visibility. You need to be seen. One of the critical things about road safety is about making sure that you are seen that the other people can see you. And that's why I recommend for cyclists to put on reflector jackets. Right. Anybody who is using the road, whether you're pushing a handcart or whether you're using a motorcycle or whether you are cycling a bicycle, please put on a reflector jacket. Ensure that you are seen. Visible. You are visible. Mm. Because when you're visible, then people can be able to tell mm. that there's, a, there's someone there and I need to slow down so that I, cannot, I, I will not be able to do that. So when there's fog and mist, put on your headlights, slow down, and sometimes it's recommended you also put hazards. All these things are actually geared towards increasing visibility, visibility. to make sure that you're seen. Because sometimes you put the headlights and you realize you're also not, um, uh, the, you need the person behind you to see mm. that there's someone ahead of mm. you. So sometimes you put on the hazards and you drive through that until that point whereby you can be able to do that, uh, to, to be seen. Sometimes you'll find there's a construction and the road is very dusty and there's so much dust when the vehicles are going around and you can hardly see. Again, you treat that the same way you treat the fog. Put on your lights, put on hazards, uh, slow down, ensure that you're able to see all the other road users around you. Night driving as well, is something that of course needs to be highlighted. Mm. Um, because visibility is also not clear. Again, depending on what kind of headlights you have, how mm. well they're working. Mm. That brings me to the other thing about the condition of your vehicle. Right. Um, sometimes, because of probably being just in town and not being not driving at night, we don't realize that our headlights are not really working the way they should. And, 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 and it's important when you're driving at night. Uh, I think there's, us there's usually um, a lesson or two in driving that you taught about how to drive at night. Uh, you need to be alert and you need to be aware of the other road users. Please ensure that your lights are on. Um, you could get into a very well lit area where the street lights are lit and everything, and you feel like, because I can see the road and everything, I don't need my, I don't lights. Need my lights. Please ensure that your lights are on. on. The principle is ensure that you are, you, 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 you are seen. In some countries where the weather conditions are different from Africa, there is a law that any time you're driving, your light should be on. Mm. And again, it's about increasing visibility. And at night also, reduce your speed. Right, reduce your speed. Yeah. All right, there's, uh, now um, you've talked about, uh, you know, the, the condition of the vehicle. Yes. And again, we sometimes do this for the sake of road stops, mm -hmm. where we are stopped, but just maybe Im the importance of service, mm -hmm. ensuring that not just your headlights, but things like your brake lights, mm -hmm. your hazards, your indicators are working because mm -hmm. those are there for you mm -hmm. and for other road users. What, what normally happens around festivities is that a lot of vehicles that are not roadworthy are brought out. They were not being used, but right, right now, since we have to go up country, we need to bring out. So the, the, and you realize just before Christmas, there's usually some traffic jam that is created. There are a lot of vehicles that were not being used 
Uh, and some of them is not because they're not roadworth, but they've been out of use for quite a long time. Mm. But now we've just brought them back to be able to do that. And if you have obse been observant, you'll find that there's a lot of vehicles that are broken down on the, on, on right, the, road, on the road because they've been, they've, been, they've been put somewhere and somebody has just brought them out because of this. It's important to have what we call a safari check. Mm. Just a check of all the basics mm. before you travel. Your, 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 your brake fluid, your steering wheel fluid, you check your gearbox oil, you check your engine oil, and generally just do a service. And this you can get in any service station or any a, a branch or any any service station, any any petrol station. They, they, they do those checks sometimes. When, 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 when they see you fueling full mm -hmm. tank, mm -hmm. they suspect you're gonna make a long journey. Right. And they say, can I check mm -hmm. your, 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 your hood? And, and therefore sometimes it's important for you to have those things checked and to confirm that they're in the proper levels that they are. The other thing that people normally ignore is your tires. And your tires, remember, is a conduct between your vehicle and the road. And the road. We have a lot of vehicles that could be driving with expired tires. Mm. And when rubber expires, the behavior of rubber is different. It, it is not the same. As, as the Rubber behaves different when it's expired. And, and by expired here, you don't mean worn out? No, no, I don't mean worn out. Mm. Tires can expire mm. on the shelf before they're sold. Is there a way of checking whether they're expired or not? Yes, there are. And anybody can check their own tires. Okay. In, on the tire, there are quite a number of writings, right. but among them you will notice uh, an imprinted four, digit, um, four digits number, uh, and that number is the, is, is the manufactured date mm. of that tire. Mm. Like, for example, uh, I saw one of my tires, and I, was, I just checked it. Um, it's 4718. Mm -hmm. It's always a four-digit word, the, the, the four-digit number. The first two digits, is the is the is the week of a year? It was manufactured. It was manufactured. The second two digits is the year. Is the year. So forty seven eighteen means a year. Forty seven week forty seven uh, of twenty eighteen because because a year has fifty two weeks. So if you, if 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 that tire was manufactured in twenty eighteen, then it has a lifetime of six years. So if you find like we're in twenty nineteen that the last digit of your tires is anything twenty fourteen. And back, you might want to uh, consider changing, consider those, changing tires. those tires. Mm. And sometimes you can see some visible signs on those tires. You will find some very little cracks, mm. many cracks along the tire. And that will tell you this tire is, is not in its best. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you see people do sell 50% off tires. Mm. It's probably they've realized these tires only have a year to go so or have two years to go. And, and, and if we keep them for the next one or two years, then uh, we're not going to be able to sell them. Uh, we're going to get into trouble. So, so they say 50% uh, sell, then you go buy. We, we normally don't check. So when you are buying tires, you need check. to check that number. Mm. And even before you travel, please check that number. You might be surprised. You may need to change your tires before you do before that. Before you do that. Because, mm -hmm. because when, you, when you're traveling and that tire experiences extreme heat or extreme cold or extreme weather condition, it's likely to burst. Mm. And when that tire bursts, then that's, of course, that's a fatality. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. As we conclude, there is mm. also the question of safety belts, particularly mm. in public vehicles. We call them Mishuki rules. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, many of us view them as um, authoritarian in terms of if, I mean, you, we are forced not, to do it. you're forced to do it. Now mm. that Mishuki, you know, uh, rules are, you know, have toned down, mm. police are not checking on that. Maybe just to underscore the importance of that safety belt in private vehicles and in public vehicles mm. as well. Um, that belt was not installed in your vehicle by the police. Mm. Neither was it installed uh, in the public vehicle by the police. That vehicle uh, seat belt was manufactured mm. together with the vehicle, mm. uh, which means that it's supposed to be used in that vehicle with or without the police. A safety belt is about your safety. What happens in the laws of inertia is that uh, uh, it says that um, a mass of body will will maintain its current state of motion mm. until acted upon by an external factor. What does that mean? When you're moving and you have a collision in your car, anybody and anything inside that vehicle maintains the same speed as the car. 
The car has stopped because of a collision, but your body maintains, continues, moving. continues moving at the same speed. And that is what causes fatalities in, in most accidents. Because you move and you go through the windscreen, you move, you hit the seat uh, ahead of you because you were not belted. When you, belt, when, 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 when you have your seat belt on, it holds you back together with the, with the body of the vehicle. Mm. So the seat belt is a safety measure for you. It's not about being caught by the police. It's not about being caught by somebody else. It's about your it's about own, you. own does, safety. Does the safety belt like tires have a way of checking whether they're still you know, in good working condition? Because again, you mm -hmm. may be driving a car that's what, 10, 15 years old? Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's important to have them checked. And one of the critical things is that the back hole must lock in properly. Um, if the buckle is not locking properly, then it means in the event of an emergency, then the seat belt will not be useful because it will come off. So one of the things is the simple check that you can do for yourself is check whether the buckle is going in and whether it's, and, and, and whether it's working. The other, the other way to just check uh, in a simple way is to try to jack uh, that seat belt. If it goes all the way, then it's not, it's not, it's not doing its work. You. It's mm. supposed to lock at some point, mm. and it's, supposed to, it's created in such a way that it's supposed to lock in an emergency. So when you pull it quickly, or when you pull it in an emergency, it's supposed to hold you back. Okay. Uh, mm. There's also the question of toddlers, small mm. babies. I've yes. seen people sometimes sit with babies and put them in the seat belt. Mm. Uh, but of course, you're left wondering that seat belt. You'd probably be the one to, you know, mm. um, uh, make give bodily harm to that child, maybe mm. even kill them, because mm. they're stuck between the seat belt and the adult. Mm. But at the same time, if you don't put them in the seat belt, mm. uh, it means they're free to. They're free. They're free to. Yeah. Go. So how uh, does someone do? One, uh, for toddlers, they need to have their own car seat, and that car seat is what you put the seat belt on. Their car seat is different and it's designed in such a way that it will hold the toddler in place. In place. Then now you strap the car seat with a, with, with the a seat no belt. more seat belt. I've seen also some people trying to drive with their kids. As in literally the kid is on sitting on their lap mm. and you're driving. I think, I don't think there's a more dangerous way of exposing your kid than to that. Danger. Because you don't even need a collision. You just need to apply the brakes. Uh, in an emergency way, and the steering wheel is going to harm this kid. So, so um, we recommend that you do not put kids in the front seat, number one. Number two, put them at the back seat and put them on their in own seat. car seat, mm -hmm. strap that car seat. Depending on the age, some of them will need the car seat to be facing back, and this, depending on the design of the car seat, but they need to be in a car seat. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when we got our first born, they, they didn't want to give us the baby until they confirmed we had a car seat. Mm. How are you going to carry this baby? How are you are taking you, them home? Are you going to take this, this baby mm. home? Mm. They, 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 they want to know that you're going to be safe. Mm. Uh, but you'll find that especially at this festive time, people travel in big numbers, mm. families. So the car seat ideally normally takes a lot of space. So many mm. people will avoid using it just by virtue of the fact that you want to fit in more people. Yeah, traditionally, kids in the African setting never used to have <laughs> yeah. the, the, the luxury of sitting in a car. But I think where you can, it is very important. If not, then you, you probably need to be able to drive at a very slow speed. A very slow speed. Yeah. All right, I want us to just look at a few things before we come and uh, you give us your rule of thumb and closing mm -hmm. remarks. Mm -hmm. But as the festive season picks, and with many Kenyans traveling up country, the Inspector General of Police, Hilary Mtiambai, last week directed traffic officers manning roadblocks to arrest excess passengers in public service vehicles and allow the rest to proceed with the journey. According to the police boss, the move is aimed at promoting sanity during this season. If you are found in our roadblocks as an excess passenger in a matatu or any PSV vehicle, we'll remove you out of that vehicle. Does not matter at what point, and the vehicle will continue with those who are seated. We note to date, as of 17th December, we have had a 13.4% increment in the loss of uh, lives on our roads in the Republic of Kenya. This is an unacceptable trend, and we shall work very hard with the Inspector General to ensure we reverse this trend, to ensure that our numbers uh, of our people on the road are uh, go a bit lower. We are working very closely with the Inspector General to ensure that all the roads are being monitored to ensure that people use the designated crossing points and the zebra crossings and the footbridges. 
All right, so that's obviously something that's happening now a lot, overloading uh, both in public and private vehicles. And according to the Inspector General there, he has given a directive that if any public service vehicle is overloaded, the mm. excess passengers will be removed and the rest will continue, but also mm. private vehicles overload. Mm. Yes, I do. And I think uh, for me is to say, uh, find another way to travel. Um, do not overload that car. That car is designed in a, certain, in a certain way to ensure that it carries a certain weight. The shock absorbers, the springs that are put, every suspension system in that car is designed in a way to carry a certain weight mm. and to be able to uh, manage emergencies with that particular weight that is usually recommended. When you overload, you compromise the ability of that vehicle, to, even if you're a good driver. It, you compromise the ability of that vehicle to be able to stop at an emergency or to be able to avoid an accident in, the, in, that, in, that, in that case. So my final remarks would be to say, please do not overspeed, do not overindulge, do not indulge. If, if, if you're going somewhere for a party, please get a designated driver. If you cannot get one of you to be a designated driver, call a taxi. Call a taxi. Call a taxi. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I want to say, Christmas is always on 25th. It's not changing and it's not running away. Your home is not going away. Mm. Even if you go tomorrow, you'll still find it. So please plan. Plan ahead. Plan for that journey. Make sure that you, 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 you're you prepared. Take good rest and plan to go at the right time. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Anthony Kelly, who is uh, with the AA, for joining us this morning to just give us tips mm. and uh, precautions on your journey and how